All right, so what we're looking at is getting confidence intervals for the mean mu of a population, right? Um, and we saw, well, at least I mentioned previously, that we have a couple cases, well, four cases that we were looking at, right? When we look in um, for confidence interval for a single population mean mu, right? Okay, so first case, and we did an example of uh, this already, right, is when you're dealing with a normal population with known variance, um, sigma squared, and any sample size n, right? Okay, so now the second case that we want to consider, the second case is that um, we have a population, we don't know the probability distribution, right? Um, however, we know the variance, right? Um, and um, we also have a large sample size, right? Um, Okay, so this sort of setup over here, when you have um, a known probability distribution, right, um, large sample size, that's probably hinting to you is what you're going to do is you're going to use central limit theorem, right? All right, okay, so let's consider this um, uh, formula here, which will give me the confidence interval, right, um, for a population with a known probability distribution, right? Um, known variance and large sample size, right? Okay, so, right, so uh, 101 minus alpha percent uh, confidence interval for mean mu is given over here, right? So it's x bar minus um, this critical z value, z alpha on two times uh, sigma on root 10. Uh, so this is uh, your left endpoint of the interval and your right endpoint of the interval is x bar plus uh, z alpha on two uh, sigma on root 10, right? So you want to compare it um, to the case that we previously looked at, right? So the case that we previously looked at, right? Um, uh, we were getting, um, we were working with uh, a population that was normally distributed. So we were working with a population that was normally distributed, right? Um, uh, we have known variance here, right? And the sample size could be anything, right? It could be small or large, right? Okay, so this is a different case that we're looking at now, right? Um, in this case, the population, uh, it's the distribution is unknown, right? Um, variance is known just as over here, right? Um, and over here, you want the sample size is going to be large, right? Okay, so what's the difference between uh, these two situations, right? The difference uh, over here is that you know that you have... Um, a normal population and over here um, your population is um, not necessarily normal right okay so that's the first difference uh, second difference over here is that the n the sample size could be anything right but over here the sample size must be bigger than equal to 30 right and in both cases um, the, uh, the variance is in fact known right okay so for this setup over here right um, when you have um, uh, a known probability distribution for a population, right? Um, large sample size, and by large you mean bigger than equal to 30, right? And known variance. Then the confidence interval for the mean mu is given by this. And you want to notice it's the same formula, right? Um, okay. So your yeah, hypotheses are different, but you actually end up getting a uh, same formula for the confidence interval, right? Okay, and why you actually end up getting the same formula is when you derive it. Okay, so this uh, example that we previously looked at, right, um, the big X bar over here, right, was normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared on n, right? Um, okay, so this, the big X1 and the big X2 and so on, right, had um, population distribution, which was, had a, a distribution which is, uh, normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared, right? Okay, and uh, when you form the X bar, remember, you're going to have the same mean mu, but um, the variance over here is now going to be sigma squared on n, right? Now, if the X bar is uh, normally distributed with mean mu and uh, variance sigma squared on n, right? What you can do is you can scale that, right? And once you scale it like this over here, the X bar minus mu on standard deviation sigma on root 10, this is uh, has a standard normal distribution, right? Um, uh, standard normal, uh, your mean is uh, zero and standard deviation is one, right? Okay, so 
the key thing over here is that um the uh well well i guess the main thing over here is that the big x bar was normally distributed with mean mu and uh, variance sigma squared on it right and then from that um, by looking at uh, the x bar minus mu on sigma on root 10 and looking at this and working with this we were able to get um a formula right you could derive a formula from um, this confidence interval over here right Okay, so similarly over here, right, um, given these hypotheses, right, um, what we have is we have that uh, the big X bar is also normally distributed with mean mu and sigma squared on n. So it's the same as this case over here. So getting a confidence interval, right, uh, in this case is actually the same justification as getting the confidence interval in this uh, previous case when um, you actually know the population distribution, right? Okay, and what that hinges on, it that hinges on the fact that uh, the, uh, the X bar is normally distributed with mean mu and a uh, variance sigma squared on it, right? Uh, where this actually comes from, it comes from central limit theorem, right? So, uh, this is the central limit theorem, which we saw already, right? And you want to notice that the hypotheses over here, right, the setup over here is we using that in this case, right? So basically, um, in this case over here, for this setup for this confidence interval, right? Um, you have a random sample from a population with unknown uh, probability distribution, right? Okay, and over here, the um, the probability distribution is not specified for you, right? And the idea in central limit is that um, if uh, these xi's over here. Um, uh, have the same distribution, right? Uh, then the x bar, right, that you form this way by taking the average of uh, these random variables, that you can approximate by um, uh, a normal distributions uh, with mean mu and sigma squared on it, right? Okay, so in this case over here, right, um, these xi's over here, right, um, they have the same distribution, right? Um, but it's unknown uh, probability distribution, right? So using the central limit theorem, what you get is you get that uh, the big X bar in this case is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared on it, right? So that is, you use this fact from central limit theorem to get that uh, the big X bar is normally distributed with uh, mean mu and uh, variance sigma squared on it. Okay, and once you have that, right, um, you really just in the um, uh, same situation um, at this point that the, the big X bar is normally distributed with uh, mean mu and variance sigma squared on n, right? And therefore, the, um, the derivation for this confidence interval over here is actually the same as the derivation for this confidence interval over here, right? So I'm not going to repeat it, really. Um, you can just take a look at our what I said here previously, right, uh, for deriving um, confidence interval in this case here, right? So let's look at this um, third case over here, right? So again, we want confidence intervals for population mean mu, right? Um, and for this third case over here, right, um, we uh, know that it's going to be a normal population. So we know that the population is normally distributed, right? In this case, uh, we do not know the variance, right? So we need to estimate the variance by using sample variance here, right? And we have a small sample size, right? So this is the third case here, right? And that's what we want to look at over here, right? Um, okay, so how you're going to try to understand this is you're going to compare it to this um, first situation over here, right? Okay, so obviously this first situation is different, right? But what we're going to see is that the structure of the confidence interval actually for both uh, case one and case three, right? You have a similarity in the structure for the confidence intervals, right? Okay, so this is the first case here, right? Um, and in your first case, um, well, what you had was observed values from your random sample, right? And you had the observed sample mean, right? Um, so in other words, this observed sample mean is taking the observed values over here and taking the average of them, right? So you have the same observed uh, sample mean over here, right? Um, in this case, uh, you had a normal population. And in this case over here, it's a normal population as well, right? The difference between case one and uh, case three over here, right? Is this case one, right? Um, 
you have uh, a known um, variance sigma squared, right? In this case over here, right, you have an unknown variance, right? Okay, and what you're doing is you're using sample variance over here, all right? Um, so most likely what you'll be given is you're going to be given an observed sample variance, which is um, S squared over here, all right? Okay, all right, so you have an observed sample variance, and here what you have is, in case one, is that you have a known sample variance, right? The known sample variance is sigma squared, in this case, what you have is an observed sample variance, right? Um, so in a sense, um, it's sort of like the same thing, but not exactly because um, uh, you need to be careful about um, what probability distribution you're actually using, right? Anyway, so um, here the variance is sigma squared and here the variance is unknown, but you estimate it um, using uh, your sample variance. So your estimated sample variance is um, S squared over here, right? Okay, now next thing over here is that um, the sample size for case three, right, is small, right, is less than 30, right? Okay, and this less than 30 is gonna indicate to you that um, you can't use central limit theorem, right? Um, so that's the, really the main reason why you have this less than 30 over here, right? So we can't really invoke central limit theorem, right? In which case, we're gonna need to use T distribution in this case, right? But um, the structure of, um, the confidence interval, right? So notice over here, this is um, X bar minus a critical value, right? Um, times, uh, right, uh, your standard deviation of um, the, the X bar, right? Okay, and uh, similarly over here, right? Um, what you have is X bar minus a critical value. Now the critical value is a T critical value, right? And then you multiply in against um, a standard deviation, right? Uh, in this case, what you're doing is you're multiplying your critical T value over here against um, your sample uh, standard deviation over here, right? So here, the, what you had was a known standard deviation here, and now what you have is you're multiplying against a sample standard deviation here, right? But aside from that, okay, so the difference between this uh, confidence interval formula and this confidence interval formula is here, the, the critical value is a Z critical value. And here, in this case, it's a t-critical value, right? Um, notice it's uh, the same um, probability over here, the same alpha on two, right? Um, likewise, over here, it's the uh, same probability here, alpha on two, right? The difference in this case is um, because you're using t-distribution, you need to keep track of uh, the size, right? Uh, the sample size, right? Which would um, give you a degrees of freedom, which would be n minus one, right? Okay, in this case over here, you don't have that issue to deal with, right? But really in the N is just a critical value, just this critical value really has the same sort of properties as, well, very similar properties to Z critical value, right? But then other than that, the structure of your, um, your confidence interval is the same, right? So here this was uh, X bar minus critical value times known standard deviation. Here this is X bar minus T critical value times sample standard deviation, right? And your right end point over here is X bar plus uh, critical value times uh, uh, standard deviation, right? Uh, and here this is um, X bar plus uh, critical value times uh, uh, sample standard deviation, right? Where in both cases, of course, um, what you're doing is you have it's sigma on root 10, right? So when I say standard deviation, I mean standard deviation of uh, the X bar, right? All right, so you want to recall that um, when uh, for the case, uh, your first case, right, um, of um, your population normally distributed, right, um, uh, with uh, known variance, right, um, and any sample size, right, how we derived um, your formula for your confidence interval is this uh, x bar minus mu on sigma root 10, right? Uh, this had a uh, standard uh, normal distribution, right? And then what we did is we considered um, this probability statement over here, right? Um, that uh, a standard normal line between these critical values minus Z alpha on two and Z alpha on two, that probability is equal to one minus alpha, right? Okay, so that's what we did um, in your first case, right? Now, in the case of um, when we use an, um, a t distribution, right, because we don't know the, um, 
the variance, right? I'm using a sample variance. Then we again need to um, derive a formula for the confidence interval, right? But the point that I want to make is the derivation is similar, right? Because even when you look at the probability statement um, for your, um, this, uh, the x bar minus mu on big S on root 10, right? This over here, this has a T distribution, right? And now what we do is we use T critical values, right? Okay. So we use T critical values um, and the probability that um, the big X bar minus mu on big S on root N, right? Um, the probability that it lies between um, minus T alpha on two and T alpha on two. That's again, again going to be uh, one minus alpha over here, right? So really the picture over here, right, for the T distribution and the picture in the case of when you use a normal distribution, it's almost the same picture, right? There's a slight difference between the T distribution and the normal distribution because as we said, the T distribution has fatter tails, right? But again, the T distribution is going to have an overall sort of bell shape, again, symmetrical about zero, right? Um, anyway, so this, um, this probability statement over here is similar to what we did in the case of when we were trying to get a confidence interval of uh, known variance, right, um, a normal uh, distribution, right? Okay, so we at this point over here, right, uh, we consider big X bar minus mu on S on root n and the probability that it lies between these two critical values is equal to one minus alpha, right? Equal to um, this blue shaded area over here, which is one minus alpha, right? And once you have that, right, what you want to do is you want to rearrange inside here, right? so that um, in the inside over here you have mu, right? And then what you have is you have this probability statement over here, right? And from this probability statement, um, this is how you're going to get the form of your confidence interval, right? Okay, and how you want to read this probability statement is that um, if I um, observe my sample mean, right, um, and I get a small x bar, right? And if I observe the sample variance and I get a small s, right? The probability that the small x bar minus the t critical value on small s on root n and uh, that the mu is bigger than that value and the mu is less than equal to uh, the x bar, small x bar plus the t critical value and the small s on root n, the probability of that occurring is equal to one minus alpha, right? But anyway, so using this um, probability statement over here, this is, you get your confidence interval from this, right? Um, you get the form of your confidence interval. If um, to actually get the formula, what you're doing is this big X bar, you're just replacing with a small X bar and um, the big S over here, you're replacing by a small S, right? Okay, and this is similar to what we did in the case of known variance and normal distribution, right? And the interpretation of the confidence interval is in fact, again, also the same, right? All right, so let's um, do an example of using um, this formula here, right? Uh, formula for confidence interval where you, you don't know the, um, the variance and the sample size is small, right? Okay, so they give us this question, right? Um, we have a random sample of size 15, right? Okay, so you should really observe this 15 over here and realize that um, it's small, right? Small for us is less than 30, so the 15 is less than 30, right? You have, you're given a sample mean, right? Uh, which is a small x bar over here, right? And next thing you want to notice over here is that you're given a sample standard deviation, right? Um, they didn't tell you that um, your standard deviation is known, right? And they're giving you a sample standard deviation, which is this um, small s is equal to 4.94, right? Okay, so that should indicate to you, right? Um, well, once you give a, you're given, seeing a small s or you're seeing that you're told that you're using a sample standard deviation, either you're going to, well, in the case of when you have a uh, small sample size, right? Then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using this result here to figure out what your confidence interval is, right? All right, so first thing you want to note is that uh, they ask us for a 99% uh, two-sided confidence interval, right? Okay, so our usual, well, we want to get the alpha on two, right? So the 100 minus uh, one minus alpha is equal to um, 99, right? 
Right, so the one minus alpha is equal to 99 or 100 or 0.99, right? Um, okay, so I have one minus alpha is equal to 0.99, right? And then that would give me that the alpha is equal to 0 0.01, right? Okay, so I have um, alpha is equal to 0 0.01, right? Um, but my formula, right, for my confidence interval, what I need is T critical values for alpha on two and then degrees of freedom which is n minus one over here, right? So the n is equal to 15, right? So the degrees of freedom over here would be 14 over here, right? Okay, so I need critical values t alpha on two n minus one, one, where the n minus one works out to be 14, right? And then the alpha on, well, the alpha is 0 0.01, right? So the alpha on two is um, 0 0.005, right? Okay, so we need this uh, T critical value, right? Um, and we get that from the table, right? Okay, so we're gonna get this T critical value from the table, right? Uh, degrees of freedom, it's 14, all right? And what we're looking for is 14 here, degrees of freedom. And then the probability, which is the alpha on two, right? The alpha on two is 0 0.005, right? So your T critical value that you're going to be getting over here would be a uh, 2.977, right? Which is what we have over here, right? Okay, and that's probably the hardest part in this problem, right? Um, so we have uh, our T critical value over here, so we put it in, right? That's the 2.977. Uh, the sample mean, the small x bar is given to us as 59.81, right? Okay, you have your T critical value, you have uh, your sample um, standard deviation, right, is 4.94, so you put that in over here, and then you divide in by root 10, right, and N is 15, right. Okay, so you feed that into a formula over here, and you feed it in to get uh, the right end point of your interval, and therefore your required confidence interval is between 56.01 and 63.61. All right, and now what we have is we have this uh, fourth case over here, right? So look, let's look at the criteria for this uh, fourth case, right? Okay, so this is sort of similar to what went on in cases two and three, right? Um, we have an unknown probability distribution, right? And an unknown probability distribution um, should give you an idea that what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using central limit theorem, right? Um, okay, so you have an unknown probability distribution, right? Your, um, your sample size is large, right? It's bigger than or equal to 40, right? Um, okay, and then in this case, um, you don't know the variance, right? But um, even the fact that you don't know the variance, right? Um, the fact that the sample size is large, right? Means that you can actually invoke a central limit theorem again, right? Okay, so your formula for your confidence interval for this case, right? Um, when uh, you have unknown probability distribution, right? you have um, unknown variance, so you estimate your unknown variance by a sample variance, um, which is small s squared over here, right? Okay, um, and then you have a large sample size, which is bigger than or equal to 40, right? Then in this case, the form of your confidence interval is similar to what it was in um, case three, right? Um, uh, it's x bar minus a z critical value, so not a t critical value, but a z critical value, right? Uh, times s on root 10, right? Um, notice over here, in this case here, where you knew the variance, it was sigma on root 10. In this case over here, it's s on root 10. But that's the only real difference between the formula for the confidence interval in this case over here. And well, this is actually your second case here, right? Um, okay. All right, so you have a similar formula for your confidence interval, right? The only difference here is that here you use an s here. And here, in uh, your second case here, you use a sigma over here. All right, so what we were doing so far was we were getting um, two-sided confidence intervals, right? So in other words, we wanted, uh, and we were looking at um, confidence intervals for population mean mu, right? So for example, this uh, green um, shaded line over here, right? What this is supposed to indicate is it's a, you have a left endpoint and you have a right endpoint. And between this left and right endpoint, um, your population mean should be lying between this left endpoint and this uh, right endpoint, right? And the idea over here for this sort of diagram is if you repeat your experiment again, you'll get 
most likely a different uh, value for a small x bar and in which case um, remember your confidence interval is centered about the, the small x bar over here so your confidence interval it would shift right the link would remain the same but it would probably shift right and for these different um, two-sided confidence intervals um, each of these should uh, contain the population mean mu right um, okay right so that's what we were looking at before we were looking at um, two-sided confidence intervals now what we want to do is we want to consider a one-sided confidence interval right um, okay so we're looking at a confidence interval where um, we know an upper bound, right? And basically, we're just saying that um, all we care about is the upper bound, right? So the mean mu, we just want that the mean mu is less than this upper bound, right? And we don't care about um, a lower bound for the mean mu, right? Um, okay, so this here, this is a confidence interval one-sided over here. And similarly, um, we could consider um, this form of a confidence interval where all we care about is now a lower bound for the population mean mu, right? Okay, so why would you care about just one-sided instead of two-sided, right? Um, let's see, let's look at this problem over here, right? Um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at radiation levels, right? Um, okay, we had uh, a sample size of 29, right? We had a sample mean of uh, 41, 415.7, um, right? Okay, and um, what we want to do is from this here and from a known standard deviation, we want to form a confidence interval, right? But you see for these, this radiation level over here, right? Um, okay, so what we want to do is you want to estimate the um, mean radiation level, right? Um, but for your mean radiation level, right, um, you want an upper bound for it, right? Um, you want to know that your mean radiation level is not too high, right? Um, you don't really care um, for probably for lower bound for your mean radiation level, right? Um, what you really care about is you don't want, uh, if you find an estimate for this uh, mean radiation level, right? You want to know that it's not too high, right? So if you can figure out that it's less than, say, for this C over here, right? Um, uh, then that's good, right? At least we know that uh, the radiation level is, you have a, and in this case, 99% probability you have a 99 percent probability that the radiation level isn't actually exceeding this uh, c over here right so the idea is sometimes you only care about either an upper bound or lower bound and in that sort of situation you'd use a one-sided confidence interval and in this case over here we just care about um uh upper bound right Right, so let's um say derive this um confidence interval here right so where it's bounded above, right? Um, okay. Right, so it's your usual sort of setup, right? Um, what you have is you have a random sample, you have an observed sample mean, right? Okay, now in for one sided confidence intervals, right, we're only going to restrict um, to one case, right? The easiest case where uh, uh, it's coming from a normally distributed population with um, known variance uh, sigma squared, right? Um, Okay, right, uh, so in this case, uh, a one-sided confidence, 100 minus alpha percent confidence interval is given by this over here, right? The upper bound is um, small x bar plus uh, the z critical value, z alpha times uh, sigma on uh, root 10, right? And your lower bound, well, you have no lower bound over here, right? Um, okay, or you take your lower bound to be uh, minus infinity, right? Okay, so let's see how we derive that, right? And the derivation for, um, in the case of when you have a lower bound is similar to the case of uh, when you have an upper bound, right? Okay, so you um, if it's normally distributed, if uh, a population is normally distributed and each of these XIs random variables are going to be normally distributed and therefore the big X bar is going to be normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared on N, which means that when you scale it, right, you're going to get a standard normal, right? Okay, so this over here, this uh, has a standard normal distribution. And now what you do is you consider um, this probability statement over here, right? So the probability that um, your standard normal over here, right? Uh, the probability that your standard normal here is bigger than or equal to this 
the minus z alpha right so minus z alpha is over here right so that's your your critical value is located over here that's uh, the minus z alpha is going to be over here the probability that um, your standard normal is bigger than that minus z alpha is equal to this one minus alpha over here right now once you have this probability statement what you're going to do is you're going to rearrange like what we did in the two-sided case right um you uh take this sigma on root n you multiply it uh, multiply it throughout by that right then you take the minus z alpha sigma on root n and you bring it across here in which case you get plus uh, z alpha on root n and this minus mu over here comes across over here right and once you have this probability statement over here this is giving you the form of your um your one-sided confidence interval right um you this is saying that uh and so the probability that your your population mean mu is less than equal to this upper bound over here right and it becomes an actual upper bound when you feed in um an actual uh, small x bar into this the probability that uh, you mean mu is less than this upper bound is equal to um, one minus alpha right okay so using this um probability statement over here you derive your form of uh, your confidence interval right but in replacing this big x bar by small x bar right gives me my upper bound over here right and you want to notice that the this mu over here is not bounded below say so put a minus infinity there right okay so let's do an example of um uh obtaining a a one-sided confidence interval right so this same example over here with your radiation levels right um so we have a sample size of 29 right um your sample mean is 415.7 and you have a known standard deviation of um sigma which is equal to 10 right and we also know that the population is normally distributed right okay so we want to find the value of small c such that um this minus infinity c over here is a one-sided um 99% confidence interval for mu right okay so we want one-sided where we have an upper bound here right so what we're going to be doing is you're going to be using this formula over here for my confidence interval right okay so to get it right um well what will we need right well we need the small x bar which is given to us right um we need the sigma and root n so the sigma is given to us the small n is given to us also at 29 right? so we know the sigma and root n we know the small x bar the only thing left to find over here is um the critical value which is the z alpha over here right okay so we're looking at a 99 percent uh confidence interval right um okay so the 101 minus alpha is equal to 99 Okay, so if the 101 minus alpha is equal to 99, right, that means that um, the 1 minus alpha is equal to 0.99, in which case the alpha is um, 0 0.01, right? Okay, so the critical um, z value that we're looking for is z uh, 0 0.01, right? Okay, and you want to recall that I said that um, you can get certain critical z values actually from your t distribution table, right? Because uh, a t distribution with an uh, infinite uh, number of uh, degrees of freedom right is in fact a standard normal over here right okay so these are t critical values and for this row over here with the infinity right what you have is these are in fact as z critical values right so for 0 0.01 right this z critical value is um 2.326 right which is just 2.326 over here right Okay, and now once you have that, right, really you just put in all your information, right? Uh, your s small x bar is 415.7. The, the critical value is 2.326. The sigma is equal to 10 and uh, the n is equal to 29, right? And so you get uh, your one-sided confidence interval is that the mu, right, is uh, less than uh, 420, right? And, well, the mu lies between minus infinity and uh, 420. All right, so a second part of the question really is just asking you to interpret this um, confidence interval over here, right? So what can you say about your mean radiation level mu given um, this one-sided 99% confidence interval, right? Well, what it, how you interpret it is that uh, your radiation level mu, right, is 
line between uh, minus infinity and the c over here and the small c is the 420 over here so your radiation level mu is line between minus infinity and 420 in other words your radiation level mu mean radiation level mu is uh, less than uh, 420 right and you can state that at a 90 okay and you can state that at a 99 percent confidence level